Thank you all for being here. This is our final night of our Winter Recreation Series um, talks, and it's been a really fun experience to do this with all of you and to have many of you out every night. I am a professor with the uh, Masters of Environmental Management program here at Western Colorado University, and um, we try to do this as an educational learning um, activity for our students once a year. So in every fall, We've done three of them now, one that was looking at guns and sage grouse. Um, last year we looked at wildlife management and wildlife issues, but we try to choose something that's slightly controversial in our community, something that would be educational and get people coming together and talking together about the issues. And so um, thanks for being here tonight. This is our final night, and we've designed the whole series to really be informational, to try to present as much information as possible but as our final night, we wanted to get local users at the table to talk about sort of their reflections on, on this series of events and um, how it's informed their thinking around winter travel management planning in the future. And so we're really happy to have this panel with us tonight. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you guys need to go to the bathroom, there's a bathroom directly across the hall here. We've got hot cocoa and cookies over here. We won't have a break in the middle of this, so please get up and help yourself to hot cocoa and cookies if you would like that. Um, we do have a raffle at the end of the night, so um, make sure that you've signed up on the sign-up sheet um, to get a raffle prize. We have had an excellent suite of um, sponsors for this event, so we really thank them for um, donating money to make this happen, um, to be able to provide us with the food and beverages and the recording of these events so that we have a record of what happened in the room. Um, and so with that, I want to thank two special people. And whenever you do an event like this, um, you really can't do it with a lot of help. And so I want to thank our graduate students who have been helping and <laughs> you've seen them at every event. Um, so Emily and Todd, just come up for a second. <laughs> I have five colors. I don't know what colors you guys are. But a small token thank of you. just thanking you guys for all that you've done. And Um, well, with that, I'm really pleased to have John Miller with us tonight. He's with Backcountry United, and he's going to serve as our moderator for the evening. Um, he's the founder of that organization and has been working a lot on trying to bring collaboration to winter travel management. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, just give you a little brief um, history on, on why, of all people, I am sitting here with you guys tonight. Um, I'm a Colorado native, um, grew up in the Steamboat Springs area, uh, I've been snowboarding all my life, and uh, somehow got myself into the snowmobile industry um, and spent a good amount of my career uh, working as a creative director, um, helping one of the major snowmobile manufacturers uh, create their marketing. And while I was doing that work, um, I was still a snowboarder and I was looking at the way that we recreate in the backcountry from two different, very different perspectives and um, my passion for all of this kind of came to a head and I started uh, Backcountry United and the, the mission that I was on was to find a way to bridge the gap between human powered and motorized user groups. Um, and so you know, here I am five years later, and it's really excited to be a part of a panel like this and um, be given the opportunity to, to speak to people who represent um, that vision that I had years ago. So it's really exciting to be here with all of you guys, and thank you for having me. And uh, I guess we should go through and just uh, introduce everybody here and tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I'm Kevin Black. I'm with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And I'm a terrestrial biologist based here in the Gunnison Basin. I cover an area from about Monarch Pass to uh, uh, the La Garita Range, uh, almost to uh, Silverton, on up to uh, about the Arrowhead area, then covering the North Fork of the Gunnison, uh, much of uh, basically east of Delta. And I guess uh, you know the reason I'm here is that you know. 
Florida Parks and Wildlife, and specifically the wildlife biologists and the wildlife managers of our agency are tasked with a particular part of our agency's mission, and which is basically to perpetuate the wildlife uh, resource of this state uh, by conserving wildlife and their habitats to ensure sustainable wildlife uh, populations and ecosystem. So uh, I think that's uh, hopefully I can you know, bring a little bit to the table on that end. Uh, I let's say you know I'm a specific user group necessarily, but uh, I guess we'll keep more about that later. later. I'm Bill Oliver. I'm uh, on the board of directors of Silent Tracks. I'm also a retired engineer. My wife and I moved to this area about eight years ago from Los Alamos, New Mexico. Uh, I've enjoyed outdoor recreation, uh, backpacking, winter camping, hunting, fishing all of my life. Uh, we've fallen in love with, with Crested Butte and we've gotten involved in uh, nonprofits here. Uh, I'm on the board of Silent Tracks. I'm also on the CB South Metropolitan District Board. and. Uh, just feel like I want to give back something to the community after all of my years uh, in industry. So uh, I'm excited to be here and participate uh, in this forum with uh, some diverse and interesting folks. I'm Brittany Consella and um, I'm here representing Share the Slate. Um, and I'm an avid recreationist. I love mountain biking, I love hiking and backcountry skiing. My Husband and I actually met uh, trying to ski all of Colorado's 14,000 foot peaks, and we did achieve, both achieve that goal. Um, I ended up being the second woman to do so. Um, and then we did write a backcountry skiing guidebook, which was released last year. Um, and that was published by Mountaineers Books. Um, but beyond that, I'm here representing Share the Slate, which is mostly a group of hybrid users. Um, we've gone over that term a few different times, but that's basically using a snowmobile to access backcountry skiing but kind of like what john uh, was describing we really view ourselves as kind of the sort of people who are bridging the gap between motorized and non-motorized users as we kind of are both of those and we see the big picture so i hope to bring that aspect to the table awesome um hello everyone my name is chris barant um, i own and operate a company called barant's backcountry adventure um, we take uh, folks just like yourself and people from all over the world and um, have them experience um, a passion that I've <clears throat> been exposed to since the age of six years old. I've been born and raised in Colorado and uh, my parents threw me on a snowmobile at the, at the young age of six when I couldn't even touch the running boards and, and uh, uh, I've been uh, hooked uh, ever since and you know so to be able to have the opportunity to um, show people um, what the sport of snowmobiling has done for me in my life um, is uh, we, we say I, for me it's the the best job in in the world uh, to share a passion that we all have uh, to be able to sh share that passion with other people um, is is pretty amazing so i'm excited to be able to talk to you guys about uh, my experiences um, with that and uh, represent uh, uh, the motorized community well, I have a note to touch on the idea of collaboration and I think uh, it's really important that we kind of take a pause and, and think about um, you know in regards to our public lands you know it's like these lands are your land or and they're my land but really they're they're our land and um, you know public lands are a very democratic idea and they really are intended to serve us in so many ways, uh, the population, the greater good as you know, I think the Forest Service would coin the term. And it's super important that, you know, I think in the past, um, there's been a lot of travel management um, moves that have happened, you know, there's one going on in California, for instance. And, and I know that um, from watching that, there's been a lot of cases where certain users didn't feel like they got to be at the table um, during that process. And uh, I think it's really cool and, and special that you guys are having um, this type of a forum in your community to create that opportunity where people from all these different um, perspectives can come together and, and hopefully uh, find some empathy with one another. Uh, maybe you know understand where other people are coming from and uh, you know hopefully make friendships and 
and work through problems together because you know what we're all doing we're a small piece of the population just the people in this room you know we get the opportunity to sort of frame up the way that we think about these lands and, and how they will serve us in the future so I think it's really exciting to have a diverse group of perspectives that that get to come around and, and um, figure out how we can work together so uh, and so with that I just want to go through with each of you um, if you could just briefly <laughs> describe uh, your winter recreational use and why you value it and uh, you know, how does that relate to the winter planning process? And then do you have any kind of fresh ideas about how, you know, coming from your perspective, uh, there could be some other approaches that haven't been used in the past in, in how we manage it in the future? Right, well, I'm not going to really describe my personal winter recreation usage, um, but I will speak more broadly of why there are these wildlife related stakeholders out there. Uh, you know, these wild critters uh, found in these winter areas of travel management concern, they can't just go home at the end of the day and hop in a hot tub and warm up. They live out there, they, they depend on these landscapes, these mountainsides as their home. Uh, and wildlife, they can't speak for themselves. Uh, but there are also a range of human stakeholders out there um, that are uh, speaking up for them. Uh, and these stakeholders, at least in terms of our, what our agency is most concerned with, is uh, really the, the hunting members of our community, uh, the user group that is uh, predominantly funding the source of our uh, agency's funds. Uh, not just, you know, to perpetuate this idea of hunting, but uh, I believe the last uh, series, I guess the last uh, segment of the series, you guys heard from a, uh, uh, a research project studying the links. Uh, well, links were brought here to state the state of Colorado. We are not hunting them. We don't think we are going to be doing that anytime soon. Uh, but they were brought here with sportsman dollars, uh, or a large part of it was. And so uh, this. You know, what hunters are doing is not just so that they can go harvest an animal for their own good. A lot of them are doing it because that is the mechanism that funds a lot of wildlife conservation work. Uh, but on top of the hunters, uh, we also have wildlife watchers, uh, wildlife photographers. And uh, then this, I guess, maybe a less vocal segment of the community, uh, but the, the tourist that comes here and sees a moose uh, on their trip. A lot of times, maybe I've never seen a moose before, and that is the highlight of their trip at the end. Uh, you know, they'll look back on that. Uh, but, um, you know, when it comes to the wildlife side and, and what has been happening over the past, I would say, 150 years, you know, when the initial wave of settlement came in, uh, a lot of these wildlife species were almost removed from the landscape. Uh, efforts of hunters and anglers have brought many of these animals back. And so uh, it's, it, there's, I, I just want to speak one more, sorry, I'm probably going over, but uh, uh, you know, these folks aren't out there just to hunt these animals. Um, they are not just another recreation user or recreational group um, that, uh, that is out there on these forest service or public <coughs> lands. Um, a lot of people are in it uh, to bring home organic, sustainable uh, food sources. Uh, there's uh, some cultural heritage going on. We've, you know, we've been hunting in Gunnison Basin for 10,000 years uh, with the Folsom uh, you know, artifacts that have been found here uh, demonstrating that. And I think uh, as the human population increases, it's going to become more and more difficult for wildlife to thrive. And so that's kind of uh, where our agency comes in is how to we, how are we going to sustain this resource with a growing human population? And that is a huge challenge. Uh, as far as uh, the rest of the, um, yeah. I, I think it's a little too early to comment exactly <laughs> on that. Sure. But uh, uh, I think we'll be. It's a process. Right, right. Uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, I'm sure, uh, will be a uh, close collaborator 
when it comes to the actual uh, management planning process, um, when it comes down to it with the Forest Service, or we hope to be. So you guys will work with the different agencies um, depending on issues within specific regions? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, I mean, the, the whole process, and we're not even, I'm not even sure how close we are to that, but. Uh, yeah. Right on, thank you. Uh, how about uh, you, Bill? Okay, well, uh, as regarding my winter recreational use and values, uh, I really enjoyed uh, Nordic and downhill skiing. Um, I particularly love the Lily Lake experience in November. Um, I use the Cement Creek drainage for uh, Nordic a lot and uh, also participate uh, in the Nordic trails at CB Nordic and I teach ski school up at uh, CBMR part time. So uh, together I spend quite a bit of time out in the, in the country, in the back country and uh, also in the uh, organized events uh, in the wintertime. Um, the thing that's happened to me since I've moved to Crested View eight years ago is I've really come to love the backcountry. And uh, although we did some of that in New Mexico, here of course is the Mecca. And the thing that I find is the peace and tranquility when I get out there uh, and I'm by myself or maybe it's just the two of us. And you can really enjoy uh, that experience because of the the oral, the audio experience, which is such a large part of my experience when I'm outdoors. You hear the water running in the rivers and you hear the wind blowing in the trees and you can hear the birds singing, the ones that stay with us all winter long and we get to know in the wintertime better than the visitors that come in the summer. It also helps me exercise and I, I'm not um, a natural born athlete so I need an excuse to get out and sweat and work hard and uh, the backcountry skiing really does it. Uh, and it keeps me mentally and, and physically uh, fit. But um, one thing that's happened over the years is I've really come to enjoy quiet recreation uh, because to me and for me, it kind of represents the way the world has changed during my lifetime. We live on a shrinking planet. There's more and more people in our spaces all the time. And, and this value of appreciating quiet use has encouraged me to really think about my carbon footprint. And personally, I'm very, very concerned about what we're hearing about climate change. In the recent IPCC report and the recent national report uh, just underscores for me personally that I, I want to think about my carbon footprint and I want to do the little things that I can to reduce it. Uh, I also feel it's really hard to do anything that's meaningful as an individual, but I think if we all do a little bit, we do what we can, when we can, we can eventually make some progress towards a, a, uh, mitigating a climate change. Now, the other part of the question was, um, you know, the winter planning process has been characterized as compromise, but how can we shift the conversation and are there other approaches for managing uh, for multiple use? And, and I, I think it's first and foremost important to recognize that uh, Quiet human-powered use is a huge component of the way we use our public lands. Um, and I think it's really important that the perspective of these groups uh, have a place at the table and their points of view be heard. And, and quite honestly, as far as I know, there hasn't been an organization to represent quiet users per se. And so I hope that as we go through this forum, uh, Silent Tracks will have the opportunity to bring some of those quiet use experiences to the discussion. Um, you know, it's, it's a huge challenge for everybody to get what they want and, and to, to enjoy everything just the way they like it. And I have to wonder with the growth of recreation in this, in this uh, state if, if it's not going to be more difficult as we go along. And will we even be able to have a, a quiet use experience in the future? But that's why we're here to work on tackling some of those problems. The other thing I'd like to mention is I see a lot of room for collaboration and I've seen a lot of great attitudes since I've moved here. Um, I see motorized users that are considerate of skiers. I see them slow down. I see they keep their engines quiet. They're not taking the muffler baffle out, for example. You know, and I'm really hopeful that through the forum we can explore new technologies 
maybe with input from all the participants, we can talk about quieter four-stroke engines, or maybe electric engines will come onto the scene in, in the near future, and we can talk about how to incorporate that into our recreational experience. So I think that's going to be an important part of the discussion in the forum. The other part of it that's important to me, and I think our membership agrees, is that when we talk about and think about awareness and courtesy, we make huge improvements in everybody's experience. And I'd like to see it part of the forum discussion, uh, some discussion about how we go about creating winner manners awareness and provide training to our visitors and our relatives. You know, most people respond very well uh, when they're reminded of things that connect them to the needs of others. And you see that. And I think the Crested Butte Conservation Corps' experience these last couple of years really proves that point. Um, we've seen a lot of great progress there. I also think that when we get together, I'd like to hear from motorized users with their ideas. Because, you know, I've spoken to a lot of motorized users over the last few years, and uh, to my great pleasure, most of them are very sympathetic, and most to, to the quiet user and the quiet user experience. Um, and, uh, you know, I think if we bring that sympathy and that willingness to help each other to the forum, then we're going to get past a lot of the tough issues that make it hard to communicate, and we're going to begin to work together in a more productive fashion. So, so it seems like we're heading in the right direction here. I think, I think this is a good first step. Yeah. We're gonna, there's a couple other questions here, and I'll, yeah. I'll tell you about my fears. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm cool. encouraged. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Brittany. Thanks, John. Um, so, you know, we were first asked to explain our recreation use, and I think I kind of already did that. Our, my organization, Share the Slate, um, I'm here representing hybrid users. Um, and, you know, the fact is a lot of us enjoy the backcountry with or without the use of a snowmobile. Uh, some of us just go rip around on a snowmobile without skis. Um, some of us have skis, some of us, you know, it depends on the day. Um, so we really consider ourselves uh, multi-use recreationists um, and not just regarding skiing. Um, a lot of us do other things like ice climbing and things like that too. Um, but you know, I, I think that we have a unique stance because we kind of get the big picture. Um, we get the quiet use needs, we get the motorized needs, and we kind of want it all. We want to have our cake and eat it too. So, um, but basically, when it comes down to it, this winter planning that we have in front of us is going to involve some compromise. Um, but I think we need to be wary of, of how that compromise is made. Um, when a lot of people think of winter travel um, that's already in place in the state, they think of a lot of major passes, uh, such as Rabbit Ears, um, Wolf Creek, um, Vail Pass, and what they've done in those is they end up having one side of the highway be motor accessible to motorized, and the other side of the highway is uh, exclusively non-motorized. So you know, and I caution that that works for maybe those areas possibly, but for our area, we don't have a major highway, um, you know, going through here that's going to split one side of a pass to motorized and the other side to non-motorized. Um, so when we start thinking about how our planning looks, you know, we have corridors. We have Slate River Corridor. We have Kepler Pass Corridor. We have Washington Gulch Corridor. And if, you, if we decide to make some of those corridors not accessible to motorized users, you're blocking thousands of acres to huge, you know, a large set of users. Um, so you know, we have to start thinking about that, what that's going to look like. I, our organization discourages that you know, blocking off corridors. And we, we want to think about other ways um, to have, you know, a quiet use area versus a motorized area, um, you know, and still <coughs> allow passage through certain corridors, um, you know, so that everybody can have access to a greater area, but maybe have some segregation here and there um, to a, a basically to appease the quiet use areas. So just a word of caution on that. Um, and so I think when it comes down to it is we need to shift our thoughts on promoting these shared use corridors and 
part of how we need to do that is kind of alluding to what Bill said. Um, we also need to be understanding of other user groups. Um, we need to be educated about their needs as well as your own needs and their desires and basically promote a culture of understanding and, accept and acceptance. Um, and you know, Cheryl Slate believes that through education and awareness, recreationists can learn to coexist in these shared spaces. Um, so when it comes down to it, winter travel is really an exercise in social education. And I think that's kind of what we have for us down the line. I think that's really smart idea to, to think of it as social education. It's even bigger than the task at hand, which is already a big task. Yeah. Um, but yeah, how do you how do you get, you know, we're all like grown children, us adults, and we kind of have to figure out how to play together in the sandbox. Um, what do you think, Chris? Um, well, you kind of mentioned, you stole my opening statement. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I saw him at Arby's. He did like pretty much say exactly what you yeah. said. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so, so I will reiterate it. Um, you know, one, one thing that I've grown up with the belief from, from my parents and just my experience um, in Colorado essentially was um, it's not my land. It's uh, not your land. It's all of our land. And um, I think, you know, that, that statement just rings so true with all of our goals and missions here are, are essentially the same. I think um, Bill just read exactly what I wrote, um, except he enjoys it uh, silently, and I enjoy the exact same type of experience on my snowmobile. Um, I, I literally feel like Christopher Columbus out there um, exploring, seeing around what, what's around the next corner. And, and it's, it's, I think what's so great about a platform like this and that we're getting to talk about this in early stages of it is, is if, you, if you listen to all of us, we're all asking for the exact same thing. We want the same thing. We want to be able to, to share and experience and everything. And so I think what's most important about that is that when we start um, when we start taking away to give to someone else? Well, that, I mean, that's not how I would want it in my group. That's not how you would want it in your group. And so, you know, as uh, I will say for us as as snowmobilers, and I was having this conversation this evening, um, we're not asking for more land. We just want to ride what what we have currently. And so, um, and and to be able to to share that because. We don't want to take away a potential experience for someone. We're just hoping to be able to, you know, I, and, and I talked to you about my job. That's what my job is. My job is opening these people's eyes to what is actually possible, not only on a snowmobile, what, but what is possible to, to, uh, to push yourself as an individual, to, to see places that you never thought you'd be able to, to see before. And, you know, all those types of things, no matter whether it's on a snowmobile or on skis or, or on a snow bike or whatever, all of those, if, if we don't have the opportunity to, to be able to do that equally and, and fairly, well then um, I think that goes away from what we're all trying to accomplish here, and that is uh, that we all get to enjoy it. And, and so um, I, I really, it was awesome being the last one because it was like, well, he made an awesome point. That's exactly what I was going to say, except I'm on a snowmobile. And, and so we're all we're all going to the to the general direction and the goal. <coughs> and um, a com compromise is a is a what I've learned from um, from being a part of of the four nights and and being able to just to be a part of this in general is um, I don't want to be um, a person a narrow-minded person. I want to understand. The, um, what everybody else is needing. And so I've become, and this kind of goes into question number two, but you know, it's, I want to become more educated on what exactly Bill and, and his people are, are needing and wanting and, and, um, and vice versa. So, so we can all just make a better plan. Because again, my whole goal is I don't want to lose any, I just want to share it. Well, and who wants conflicts too, right? Yeah. And uh, you know, one thing that I I think is interesting, you know, I've I've known Chris for a long time. I know of you know Brittany's work, and um, 
And I think it's really interesting to note, I mean, you're a big bow hunter, like human powered bow hunter in the fall, right? And, you know, it, I think it's <laughs> interesting to note that just because somebody rides a snowmobile or a mountain bike or a dirt bike, doesn't make them a dirt biker or a snowmobiler or a mountain biker. We're all human beings that just want to be outdoors because that's where we come alive. And, uh, and I think that's the common ground here. Um, and, you know, uh, Kevin brings a perspective to it as well, where, you know, we've not only do we have to think about other users, but we've got to think about the other life out there too and, and uh, how that all, all meshes and, and flows together. So, uh, yeah, and so you started answering question two, Chris. Uh, maybe we just come back this way uh, from, you know, Brittany, go next and, and talk about uh, what you've learned uh, and how your perspective has maybe changed a little bit since this series began. Um, do, you, do you want to answer more? Do you have yeah, more to answer? Yeah, I, I, have just, I have just a couple more. And um, so one, one thing, so we live in a very social world now. With uh, uh, we have access to everything with our phones, and, and social media is a, a very powerful tool. And so, on the surface, um, being a snowmobiler, the only time you really hear anything uh, discussion-wise is they're trying to close us down. We need to rally the troops, and we need to write letters, and 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 it seems like we have four days to do it. Where did this come from, you know? Um, they gave you more time, they gave us. <laughs> well, it, I mean, so that's, so that makes it, it makes it really hard um, for someone to, um, to, to not have a plan going. And then, so then, you, then you're just speaking with raw emotion and they can't shut us down. Why didn't I know about this sooner? And so I think, you know, when, when I heard about this, I was like, well, I mean, this is exactly what we, everybody should, should, I mean, we should have steps instead of just like, okay, this is going to happen. Does anyone care? Or, and so I, I think that's the biggest thing for me is getting everybody more educated so we can make a, a better plan moving forward. And, and so, um, you know, that's something that I've learned here to take away from here and um you know but that's that takes a, a lot of work and and if we notice you know all the, all the faces in in this room um you know we're a fraction of how many users there are out using our public lands so but we, you know we are the ones who uh, take who care about this and have a passion about this and, and for me personally i just want to help and be better and be more educated about it well, I think it's interesting too that um, in a forum like this, you know, it's one thing, to, you know, collaboration, we're all collaborating, we're all at the same table, but, you know, if, you, if you're to peel into that a little bit more and understand that to come to a good plan, you have to, there, like, there has to be like a, an incubation time, like people need the opportunity to talk about it, understand it, have a rapport, so, you know, we're, we're bouncing off of each other and you know, over time we come to something good versus, I think you brought up a really good point, Chris, that it always seems like this last minute thing and, and tempers are flaring and nobody had the opportunity to understand each other, let alone come yeah. up with a plan. So the point was, there was all of this stuff going on, but either nobody knew about it or nobody wanted to let everybody know that this was going on. And so I think that can start from a, a much higher level to get more people to understand that you can have a voice in this um, and here's the process. Um, and, and we should use that powerful thing called social media instead of posting pictures of your cats. We should be able to, <laughs> to, to actually use it for, for the, the better good. So in turn, we don't get resentment and anger from a decision that, well, I didn't know about it. Well, maybe we should try to do a better job of knowing about it. That's awesome. Brittany, what do you think? My turn? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I mean, Chris is exactly right. We are so lucky to have this series. Um, and I want to thank Matt McCombs for really kind of being the visionary behind this. Um, you know, I really think you prompted this, and I, I feel pretty um, 
happy that you you know to be under your leadership in this in this national forest. I think you're, you're already moving us in the right direction for this. <coughs> um, but I think as far as what you know you take from this series, um, I don't think our organization learned a whole lot uh, because we are so we just know a lot about this already. But I think having you know these this information available to the public was awesome. And I think that what it really did was um, kind of firm some important ideas <laughs> and some overarching things that we all keep hearing over and over again. Um, so, you know, I think that there are a lot of ideas that need to, need to be taken into account when we are looking at um, you know the the information that's going to guide us through this pro this winter travel process. Um, some of it is behind the need for third party unbiased data, um, and some of it is behind the local community to have their input. Um, you know, one of the things that we've seen as in, in these in these discussions about winter travel and the forest travel as well or forest management as well is that there are a lot of national organizations um, that start to come to the table as part of these conversations and you know I, we almost become puppets in these national discussions but when it comes down to it we are the local people who live here. We are the people who use our public lands, and we need to become educated um, on, on everything about them in order to preserve them and be a part of the discussions and not let some of these national organizations really take hold of the conversations for us. So I think that that's something that we need to be wary of. Um, and another overarching goal is that we need to continue the cl collaboration that we're already having with the stakeholders, um, you know, starting here. But there's more stakeholders, you know, that are that we need to account for, um, and we need to continue that discussion um, as we begin the winter travel process. Um, and part of that collaboration process, I mean, we have some really awesome people to to use as models for this. Um, you know, even our own Gang of Nine decision, which was created back in 1995, that was basically the winter travel decision of 1995. Um, that brought a bunch of stakeholders together and created the winter travel that we do have now in the northern end of the valley. Um, that's a great model for us to continue following. Um, also, we have, right now, we have the Gunnison Public Lands Initiative. They've brought together a bunch of stakeholders as well. Um, and their discussions mostly focus on, on, on summer, but some winter use as well. Um, and I think it's a really important model to follow. Um, there's, I don't know if you guys have heard of this, but there was the Teton Public Lands Initiative, which just failed uh, about a month ago. And part of the reason why that initiative failed was because they brought some stakeholders together and then they broke them apart and each, and created a bunch of different groups, and they created four different proposals, and each proposal had its own agenda associated with it. But contrary to that, our Gunnison Public Lands Initiative brought all the stakeholders together, and they did not leave that table until everybody agreed on the proposal that they created. And that's what needs to happen if we're going to do something like that for our winter travel. We can't break apart and come up with a bunch of different proposals with a different agenda that will not be successful, that will lead to ultimate failure. Instead, we need to come together and, as a group and collaborate and make sure that we can come up with a plan that everybody agrees on. Um, that will make it more valid in our community, and it will make it more valid um, you know, to to, our, to the public that we're trying to pass this to, pass this on to. So I think that's especially important. Yeah, we, um, we went up to Jackson for the last meeting and one thing that 
kind of came out of listening to that conversation. Uh, it was like a three hour meeting that was supposed to be an hour. And, and it was interesting watching them all sort of banter uh, to the last minute until they were all sort of like uh, pressure cooked to the, to the limit where they had to finally just come to a decision. Um, and it seems like one of the things that, that took so long for that group of people to come to that conclusion was it was slightly off balance. It was a little bit skewed to, to one side than it was on the other. And, um, and that's why they, they kept running into stalemates over a period of time. So uh, I think that's a, something else to note on what you're saying is mm -hmm. you've got to make sure that, that that whole thing is kind of counterbalanced, that there's enough uh, perspective that, that brings an, almost an equal uh, weight to, to each side of it. Uh, what do you think, Bill? Well, this question really stimulated me to take notes. Um, and so I've got some, some notes here I'd like to kind of go over with you because I had to think about this a lot. But the first part of it was what was my perspective on learner travel management. And the truth is, I'm a novice. Uh, the winter travel series has helped educate me considerably. It's been very interesting listening to some of the speakers from the Forest Service and uh, Phil Chamberlain from our, our county commissioners. Um, you know, I had a vague idea that if everybody's willing to compromise, we could, you know, come up with a plan. Um, I'm really sympathetic in my personal view that to the fact our world is shrinking, there's more and more people coming and it's making it more and more challenging. And quite honestly, I think as the challenge grows, you know, motorized users are gonna be uh, facing more threats to their access and the truth is, I think that if we have more growth in motorized use uh, and they get everything that they want, presuming I know what they want, which I'm not saying I do, uh, I wonder if it'll be possible for quiet users to have a quiet experience in the future. So I think that's a really important element to keep in mind as we talk about uh, winter travel management planning. Um, and another perspective I had before the series was I had assumed the Forest Service would show up with a silver bullet and just solve all the problems <laughs> and we'd all go home. I, I'm not so sure that's going to happen right now. Um, it's getting a little more complicated. Uh, they had, the question also said, uh, how has your perspective changed? And it has changed, definitely. Um, I do think it's going to be more challenging than I imagined. Um, I, I also uh, fear that our, all users are going to end up losing something. I don't know that for a fact, but I think we're going to have to work really hard to, uh, to deal with that possibility. Uh, I think that's, you know, by virtue of closures, perhaps, or by virtue of rapid growth, you know, in winter recreation. Um, but obviously, the only option is to work together, and this is a great start, and I think we can make this really productive uh, for our community. You know, i got to tell you personally, I wish I could go back in time 20 or 30 years ago and we wouldn't have to be here at this meeting, you know? Because when I was growing up, everything was okay. It was, it was all open, and you just went, and you had fun, and you did what you wanted to do, and there wasn't a lot of issues, you know? But I personally believe, and I believe our membership believes, that we're going to have to subordinate ourselves to the needs of the natural environment. You know, our planet and our community, our natural environment has been challenged for decades, and I personally hope we can put preservation of the environment at the top of the list as we start talking about winter travel management planning. Um, and it, the other part of the question was, were there any lessons that we'd like to build off or avoid? And I'd, I'd say uh, it was very clear that the Forest Service has a lot of rules and regulations to work within. We understand that there are constraints. Um, and we really think the Forest Service is going to have, have to help the, the participants in the planning process understand the rules of regulation and constraints so that we can be productive as we deliberate how to get to the end game. Um, I think it's really important that all the stakeholders have an opportunity to participate fully, as uh, I think you were saying a minute ago, and Brittany was pointing out, if, if we don't have that from the get-go, things can fall apart real quick. Um, and I strongly believe that Colorado Parks and Wildlife has to have a, a, a very pivotal role in our deliberations. Um, one of my critiques of the GPLI was we had a lot of good representation 
from multiple stakeholders, but our agency personnel were not actually active members of the working group. And so I will hope that when we establish a forum for travel management, that we have active members on the forum from Parks and Wildlife and the Forest Service in this next exercise. Um, you know, another thing that came through is that it's going to be up to us at Silent Tracks to help ensure that people understand our motivations and our perspectives and what our priorities are. And so we're going to try to communicate as clearly as we can and hope for understanding. And you'll have, we understand we've got to reciprocate. So we need to listen. We have to commit ourselves to listening to the perspectives of the other stakeholders in the community. And I, I think that, that can be done. Um, but we're going to have to look for common ground. And um, we're going to have to all hope we get something out of uh, the whole process that we can live with. I wanted to mention that uh, Phil kind of warned us at his talk, uh, the second talk, that um, it's probably going to be some disagreement uh, as we go through this whole process. That's probably normal. But uh, we're going to be committed to work with the other participants to figure out workable compromises. And I encourage that that's the way it's going to work out listening to people here tonight. Um, it was real clear from some of the stories that we've heard that coming to a forum with, a, with the uh, confrontation or polarizing attitudes uh, with the stake in the ground isn't going to work. And I, I got a lot of confidence in the residents of Gunnison County. You know, they're, they're quite capable of working through issues. And we saw that happen with GPLI. And I think overall, it's been a, a really good example for us in the community. I hope we can, as Brittany said, use that as a model. Uh, and I hope we have some, some outside facilitation in our process of uh, developing a winter travel management plan. Do you think it's uh, important to, you know, in talking to having more uh, presence from CPW and other stakeholders, do you think it's important that uh, everybody has like a, a real live boots on the ground perspective of the lands that you're talking about? Yeah, that kind of comes up in these questions later. I'll jump ahead. I think it's real important as one of the initial steps is that we get focused on what the actual issues are, and then we get the background material, the baseline information, and all of the stakeholders participating need to do their homework and understand what baseline information there is first before we launch into deliberations. Yeah. And I think when we get into topics about uh, forest regulations or environmental concerns, I think we got to step back as an individual stakeholder who knows what I want or Brittany knows what she wants, and I think we've got to listen to the experts in the science realm of the discussion. Right. Okay. Maybe that's a, a good segue for you, Kevin. Uh, I'll wait for maybe the next further question, Jan. But uh, <laughs> as far as the specific question on you know, what has this series changed in, I guess, in my mind, uh, I, I was kind of surprised uh, to <coughs> see the uh, uh, such a focus on some local conflict areas. Um, and I kind of think coming into this, uh, it'd be maybe a little more focused, broader scale, FEMA wide. And, uh, and even before that, I was thinking kind of some basin wide. Uh, so getting the other uh, land managers involved in this. Um, I, so, I, you know, I, I guess the importance of that is. Uh, at least pertaining to wildlife, is there a landscape scale species, the impacts you have on a particular uh, herd of animals or maybe a group of animals on one end of the basin uh, can basically influence the population at another part of the basin. A lot of these animals are migratory, so they're moving large distances. Uh, some uh, maybe are not so migratory and they can hang up in these uh, high elevation uh, pockets of uh, windblown slopes, like bighorn sheep or mountain goat, for example. Uh, so I, I guess uh, I think as this process evolves, hopefully uh, take a larger landscape scale approach. Uh, I think that's going to have to happen. A lot of people have mentioned or maybe not a lot of people, but I've heard a few comments through the series. And, uh, well, we need to spread the usage out. We won't have conflicts in little areas. Unfortunately, what that tends to do is uh, make it harder for wildlife to thrive on a larger scale. Uh, and as you get more people, you know, maybe that's a, maybe spreading the usage out is a solution in the short term. But eventually, those areas are going to become full too. Uh, so then you're at the same spot. Uh, 50 years from now and wildlife 
uh, will probably not be part of the equation because there won't be any. Uh, so yeah, I, I, it's, it's been interesting and I'm, I'm glad this, uh, this series has taken place and we've been called you know, to speak here tonight and uh, you know, like, uh, in reference to his comment, uh, yeah, I, I, I think uh, our agency, uh, I, I hope that we take a more active role. Um, a lot of our agency budgets are stressed pretty thin. Um, and the fact that I couldn't be here the nights two and three, and so I caught up on the videos uh, in the last few hours here. Um, but um, yeah, it's a uh, it, it, well, maybe this early in the game. Um, you haven't seen us much, but I think we'll be present more later. Good. I think it's important to clarify that I do think that there were conservationists and I thought there was some wildlife representation on the GPLI, but I just don't think it was an agency representative, is that correct? That's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not like that group, it's not like they ignored wildlife. No, <laughs> if, that was, if that's what I, you heard, that wasn't my intention. Yeah. No, there were a lot of good representations on yeah. the GPLI, but I would like to see the agencies have a, a, a seat at the table, not a chair reel. Well, it's interesting, uh, just what you were saying about, you know, you're, you're starting to project what you know into a future model in your head as you're talking about it. And, um, and that kind of leads us into the next question, which is uh, what research could be done that maybe hasn't been done before that uh, could inform um, the future of how these things are done. Uh, and, and maybe it's maybe it's doing you know slightly tweaking something that's already been done before, or maybe it's a radically different approach. Uh, what, do you have any thoughts on? Well, um, I guess uh, you know our agency does rely heavily on research. We are a uh, you know, we try as much as we can to use the best available science when making management decisions. Um, when it comes to maybe us commenting on a land proposal, for instance, if the Forest Service uh, is planning on doing something to the land, uh, they'll often call on us for comment. And in those comment letters, we uh, are basically calling upon past research. Uh, you gotta learn from your mistakes. That's really all science really is. Uh, but um, as far as research that can inform our agency's role uh, in this process going forward, or maybe just how this process comes about, you know, I think this this series here is a great initial step. Um, but um, you know, I think the, maybe the key is, and I'm gonna. This isn't necessarily a wildlife tool, wildlife management tool, but we do uh, call upon our stakeholders when uh, we, are, we are making wildlife management decisions through either public surveys or through adaptive management processes where uh, you know, we're, we're serving the people, uh, seeing what their opinions are. Uh, and uh, I think this is actually dovetailing in, in, into the final part of this uh, forum of discussion here, but uh, really uh, getting a, an objective handle on what people want, I think is, is, is great. Uh, there are 50 people in the room here, but there that represents a small proportion of the actual users that are out there. It'd be great to have everybody in Gunnison. Everybody in Gunnison seems to be a winter recreation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Do you like but, winter? Come here. <laughs> <Tuesday> <laughs> night. Um, but I, I have a feeling when these stakeholder groups get together, it is uh, a little more subjective. And um, a lot of ideas get thrown around. We don't really know the truth. Uh, and as far as what people desire, and you know, some objective surveys, uh, online surveys, or, or something that can actually quantify what people want, I think would be useful. Um, the common Joe, uh, you know, maybe each of us has some segment of winter recreation that we're interested in, or usage of the landscape in the winter time. But I think. Uh, we maybe only represent a small cross-section 
and then the common Joe out there, there are people in Gunnison that will, you know, that maybe they are mining or logging one season for a job on the public land. The next season they are, uh, you know, they pick up a, a rifle and they go pull some meat out of, out of the field. Uh, then they'll put on their skis on another season. Maybe they'll go look for shed antlers in another season, pick up the rod and reel another season, uh, and then jump on a mountain bike in another. And so uh, it, when you are a public land user like that, you, you're really not, uh, it's really hard to become super engaged in one particular topic, but the winter recreation is, is pretty important to you. Um, so uh, yeah, perhaps some uh, actual surveys or would be useful as yeah. the process moves forward. Well, I was curious, uh, just from, I, was, I actually worked on the Bill Pass Task Force uh, for a year and a half, and that was the first uh, meeting that I missed, but they did commission some reports where they were putting trackers on different users and, and wildlife. Do you guys do a lot of that kind of thing already, or? Uh, on the wildlife side, yeah, and I um, would like to see more from the human utilization modeling side. Uh, a lot of those tools that the, the presenter at the last uh, night three, uh, basically were using tools that were developed in the wildlife field. Um, and some of that, a lot of that data really <laughs> is rarely collected on humans, it's actually collected more often on animals. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. So uh, the technology's the, there. The technology's there, some of the analysis, as far as collecting data is even better with Strata and all those apps, right. certainly improving. Um, but uh, you know, a lot of those studies uh, and analyses need to be, uh, you can't just pull up a Strava map and, and take their reward for it. I mean, you gotta think about sampling design. Um, you know, if you are going to go, you know, how many transmitters do you put on, uh, or do you monitor from some of the users versus cross-country skiers right. and so forth. And um, how do you find those people? Like, who are those people, you know? Right, right. <laughs> uh, so there, there could be some biases that need to be teased out. Um, and that's uh, gone a little bit of tangent yeah. there, but I am heavily interested in that kind of um, um, distribution data of animals and people, too. So, uh, cool. Yeah, I think... Um, um, this early in the game, perhaps some more of those kind of uh, analysis and studies can take place. You know, if if a forest service is going to roll out with a plan in the next year, it's yeah, I don't think it's <laughs> yeah. But maybe there's there's opportunities. So. Cool. What do you think, Bill? Um, well, we we, we think, think there's, there's a couple areas. areas. I'm, I'm sure there's more uh, that uh, warrant some some uh, some study. And first and foremost, I'd, I'd like to have a, a, a primer for the participants on what we know about wildlife in our area already, what we know about elk pattern migration, uh, what are uh, sensitive areas and what are unsensitive areas. Um, and I think we need to kind of do that to, to set the stage for further discussions about what we want to do with, with winter travel. Um, as I mentioned earlier, for me, I think we've got to give the environment a, a lot of consideration in this day and age, considering all of the challenges that our planet's facing. Um, and I hope to see um, CPW and Forest Service really helping with that. Now, the other area that I'm pretty excited about is this uh, Western Colorado University Data Collection Initiative. They got a good start on that about three years ago. We're starting to see some very interesting data about the types of users, the numbers of users. And I hope that's continued. I hope it's expanded. Uh, perhaps we can add some qualitative survey uh, data to it to understand how people feel about their experiences in the backcountry. Um, and uh, I think when we can do that, we'll begin to see trends. The trends will help inform decisions. It will result in better policy uh, debates and better policy outcomes. So those are the two areas that uh, are top of our, of our list for additional research. Cool. Um, so in my previous response, I mentioned the importance of unbiased third-party data. And, um, Bill and I have actually supported the, the, the data collection efforts here at Western State, which are currently trying to gather data it, more in the northern end of the valley, but we hope it takes them southward um, towards you know, basically who's using 
our winter backcountry and what they're using it for. Um, and that's great. And they're gathering all of that data at the trailheads um, using game cameras and tracking that. Um, and that's a start because there really are no good numbers on how many people are out there using our backcountry. Um, so that we need to know those numbers. It's a little insane that we don't. Um, but I also think we need to know a little bit more than just those pure numbers. Um, I think, you know, Elizabeth Roberts last week, she made some, a great presentation on the impacts of recreation, uh, you know, and, and wildlife and how they did their study. Uh, you know, similar to what Kevin over here is talking, you know, mentioning. Um, we need to know where people are recreating, what they're recreating with in those areas, and how that is impacting wildlife, um, if at all. And I'd love to see more studies uh, in our area of what Elizabeth Roberts basically like described last week. Um, we need that everywhere. Of course, there's probably a lot of funding involved in that, and I think maybe some of our organizations could come together to help with, with finding some funding to help that, that kind of um, data be collected. Um, but beyond that, Bill mentioned the need for a qualitative survey, and there was a qualitative survey two years ago, and I believe that that qualitative survey is going to be repeated again this year. I'd like to see some additional questions um, as we come closer to the time for winter travel management of what people do want. I mean, just what you know, what Kevin was saying, and um, so we need that as well. The other thing I think that um, we need we need data on is when does winter travel start? So there's different ways that we have looked at winter travel. Um, the Vail Pass area is managed by dates, primarily. Um, and in conversations I've had with John Hare, who's, who spoke in, I think, the first lecture of this series, um, he has highly discouraged using dates as concrete you know, timelines for when winter travel starts for a specific area. Um, so, you know, saying, you know, snowmobiles will be allowed on November 15th or something like that. Um, and that's, that's kind of implicit in the fact that we have a kind of weird climate these days. I mean, look at last winter. I mean, it barely was winter. You can, you can say that we didn't really have winter travel in some areas. So when it comes down to it, we need to look more at snow depth. But the problem with that is that there's different kinds of snow out there and different densities of snow. And we know that a low density snow can allow for more impacts than a high density snow. Um, and, you know, and so then the depth is <laughs> like, you know, you can have like three inches of basically ice and hardly have any impact on the surface that you're traveling on from like a motorized or, you know, recreational use versus like really champagne powder. And, you know, you can have like three feet of that and still, you know, be impacting things beneath your surface. So we need more data on basically snow water equivalent, which is kind of the density of snow, um, and how it relates to, z to depth, and the minim minimization impacts behind that. Um, and I think, really, also, we need accurate economic data. Um, there was a study that, well, actually, a report that was just put out by Outdoor Alliance about our recreation in the GMUG and you know, basically they have a whole report on how much skiers, backcountry back country skiers contribute to economically to our area. The problem is, is that the deployment of that survey was really poor. It was done mostly through backcountry.com and REI nationally, um, <laughs> asking people, you know, have you been to GMUG, you know, Gunnison, or, you know, Grand Mesa, uh, medicine, I'm going Padre, but you know, it, it people could have not told the truth, and it also didn't really say like, have you visited? You know, when was the last time you visited? You know, and um, it wasn't very accurate. They also asked people to estimate their expenses. Um, this could have happened months, even years after their visitation. 
So their expenses could be really off their estimation. Um, and really, when it comes down to collecting economic data, we need to do it more at the actual point. Um, we should be gathering that data from hotels, you know, surveys done through, more through hotels, and not these national distributors that are sending out surveys to people who may or may not have used our public lands. Um, so, you know, we need more accurate economic data. You, I don't think that, that the data behind that report is very reliable. Anyway. Yeah, I actually got that survey this summer too, and it, it was full of a lot of leading questions. So it sort of made you question the, the motives or the agenda behind whoever was behind funding that particular effort. So that's a good thought. Uh, Chris, uh, what are your thoughts here? Well, um, you know, when I, when I read this question, um, and especially being last, um, it ended up being. It's, it's, it's all the same thing as far as all we're wanting to base our decisions on are fact. And if we have fact in front of us, whether there is a, um, a change or no change, um, at least we have a direction that we can move, move towards. And whether that, that fact is economical or geological, um, all of those things, that's what we're trying to base our decisions off of. That's all we have instead of emotion. Because when, when things are done on emotion, um, then the scale is, is skewed. Instead of, um, so if, if a certain person has a reaction to a decision of a closure or an expansion or whatever, and you're basing that off of fact versus um, what you emotionally feel, then at least there's, there's a path uh, when we have something to base it off of. And I think that's what we're all saying here is, for us to move forward in, in, in a positive direction, we just want to have better research. We want to have better things to base our decision um, off of. And so I think what's so important right now in this time that we are looking into winter travel management is, um, Billy said 20, 20, 30 years ago, I want to go back there. Didn't really care. I mean, didn't matter, right? Um, and so, so the permit that I work under, um, I got to see what that permit looked like uh, when it was um, initiated 20 years ago. The map for the guide outfitter was a tourist map with a map about this big, and he said, circle where you want to take your clients. Okay, sweet. I tried to do that when I got the permit, and it didn't quite exactly work. Um, but so. Again, I had guidelines and rules and understanding, you know, boreal toad habitat, lynx compaction, all of these things where, you know, going into it, being this snowmobiler builder wants to take people out, well, why can't I go here or here or here when the general public can, but an outfitter can't? Well, we have these considerations. Okay. Well, perfect. Now that I understand that, I understand you don't want me here, but how about we do this? Oh, yeah, that makes sense. That way you can stay here, the public can be here. So all that stuff, you, we can make better decisions based on fact and knowledge. And that's what all of this is for, is if we can just be, have more fact and statements instead of, again, the two-day warning and we talk about emotions, we can just make better decisions moving forward, in my opinion. I think it's interesting that you talk about emotions because um, from how I've been looking at all these things, I think something that happens when we get into emotional decisions is it sort of becomes this battle of ideology and not focused on what the actual um, reality is in those areas. It know? also changes from what we want to what I want. Instead of working together and thinking as a group, all of a sudden when they think closure, now it's like, oh, no, 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 I want this. It's my turn. And we don't need that if we have some more information to base off of. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting to think about, you know, if you were to put a layer of, you know, Kevin's data over your map, you know, you might know that I'm making stuff up here. I'm not a biologist, but, you know, the, the elk are migrating through this area, you know, for six weeks during this time frame, and you as an outfitter guide know, yeah, I'm not going to take my clients over there, like, these two weeks out of the year because of that. And, 
instead of it just being closed and then you're sure. like, well, why'd they just close it? I don't know. So it creates empathy, but it also creates that, that synergy of just understanding. Yep. That's pretty cool. Um, let's see, I think we've moved through the majority of our questions. Uh, and I, I think we've covered, you know, this last question was asking how do we move, move forward um, and past our, our particular interests. Um, I think we've, we've kind of covered off on that. Do you guys have any other thoughts on, on that front? Or? Yeah, I had to, I have one thought on the question, um, how would you like to see the planning effort proceed? And I, I don't know if I'm laboring under misconception, but I, I believe that land management agencies sort of have a, a list of things that have to be done in a stepwise fashion to arrive at a, a management plan, whether it's forest plan or or a travel plan, you know, and I think it includes things like defining issues and gathering the research that's available and understanding it and then assuring stakeholders are engaged, uh, coming up with alternatives, those alternatives get evaluated with, you know, a scientific approach and it ends up as an EIS or an EA. And I presume that's going to be the case for the winter travel management process. And I think we're going to have to get educated from the agency that leads this, presumably the Forest Service, on what those steps are so that we can prepare ourselves to work through them as a group of stakeholders and take them in a stepwise fashion. So I think if we do that, you know, the last question was, uh, how are we gonna come up with something that's supported and implementable? And I guess that's a, a fine model that we can probably make work, assuming my assumptions are correct about having a process and a stepwise way to do this. Um, well, uh, that's awesome. Uh, you know, I think, uh, can I say yeah. something, John? Yeah. Um, you know, there are a handful of winter travel management, uh, discussions happening and, and, you know, processes happening right now throughout the nation. Um, and mostly in California and there aren't any like stakeholder groups, you know, that have all come together as part of this planning process yet that I have seen. Um, I could be wrong. Do, do, am I it, you're, it yeah, it seems a little more <coughs> like everybody's got their own special interest. So, and it's like a, a battle. I almost. think we have an awesome opportunity to show the nation, um, you know, kind of lead the nation in d designing an effective winter travel management planning process by, by you know, putting together stakeholders. Yeah, and we sort of uh, reap the benefits of them making all the mistakes and, you know, us getting to learn from them, so. Exactly. It's a good call. And I think that's the most important thing that, that there, I mean, we look at Jackson, we look at California, we look at all of these things and, and it's fail, fail, fail. And so if we keep doing the exact same thing, that's the definition of insanity, right? Um, so we have to fix that. And if it's not working, then let's, Let's make it work. Yeah, and I think I would just add like another layer to this from watching what how things have been going on in, in Tahoe and Jackson and now um, the Chugach in Alaska. Uh, one thing to really notice is like it actually separates the communities like it gets ugly and that's really the most unfortunate thing I think you know you've got all these people who revolve their lives around being outdoors and their love for the outdoors. And somehow it turns into, you know, a, a big political um, separation. And, you know, and you, you look at communities like this. I'm trapped in the city, so I'm jealous of all you guys being able to live up here. Um, and when I finally get an opportunity to move to the place that I want to be, I sure would hate to get there and, and realize we're all at each other's throats over that trailhead. And so I think that's a, a really cool opportunity for you guys. Um, one thing yep. I add uh, pertaining to moving forward, I kind of touched on this, but I just want to highlight it again. I don't know if the average Joe technically knows always where the Forest Service ends and the BLM plan begins, and I don't know if it's in the cards to be working for the Forest Service, be working with BLM on winter travel management. He's probably rolling his eyes um, right now. So that's just too much of a, a bag of worms. Expensive. <laughs> yeah, and uh, maybe it's not in the BLM's uh, uh, interest at the very moment, but uh, I hope it is. And uh, it's, you know, 
there are, there are concerns that spread across from the edge of Gunnison all the way up to uh, North Crescent Buttes, so, uh, and, and other land managers too. Parks and wildlife, we have state wildlife areas, we have winter management concerns uh, of our own, and um, maybe even the National Park Service events. And I think that's what's really important is to understand the concerns of the agencies so it can so we can devise our plans to help with those concerns because we don't want to fight them we just want to help move forward with them um cool well uh i think it's been pretty cool to hear all you guys talking about this and, and to see uh the, the spirit of collaboration in your community and i think i just had an aha realization that um, western state is kind of a part of uh, your internship program. People are actually doing studies and working towards this. So uh, I think that's super cool too, that, that discussions like this are actually informing um, the next generation and, and that it's not just, you know, you're getting input from one, one side of the community, you're, you're actually getting an opportunity to hear it from everybody. And, uh, and I think that that's an important aspect to acknowledge here too, is how do you keep these kinds of discussions in front of your curriculum and um, you know driving that forward? And, uh, I think that's an exciting opportunity for for uh, the students as well. Um, cool. Well, I mean, I think we've kind of covered off on everything that we were uh, hoping to get out of this. Uh, we wanted to break off and give enough time that we could uh, ask questions from the audience and. Um, you know, if you have any thoughts or, I mean, I'd say that it's a forum, right? So if anybody even has ideas to, to throw out, I think we'd be interested in that dialogue. So does anybody have anything? Uh, is that you, Corey? Yeah, Corey Grindle. All right. Just a few comments. Thanks, guys. All, all the panelists were really helpful. Um, take a few notes as we went. I'll be really brief. Um, so I've been around here for 28 years, involved well before the Gang and I thing occurred. Um, Brittany, you make an excellent point. Even though the ownership changed at the ski area, we are not middle. We are a very different environment. We're a broader environment, fewer people, different expectations. We're not middle. A lot of our contentious management issues tend to focus around the valleys surrounding Crested Butte. They don't occur out of the Black Mesa. They don't occur down 114 towards the valley. They occur right around the areas where there's the highest traffic. So we need to consider there's contention there, but there's lots of opportunities beyond the, the six valleys that surround just the town of Crest and um, Chris, excellent stuff. Thanks for coming up. Really appreciate it. You bet. Um, it's not often we have an exchange medalist in the room, and you're very modest, but I appreciate it. Um, the youth, you, you made a point that, of what we saw in the last presentation, the use, the data, the technology, the demographics within the state are changing. Eventually, we'll be quiet for all the right reasons. Uh, use patterns are really interesting to see in Seville and the Durango area around Telluride and whatnot. Um, I think some of that has the potential to, to have us go back and analyze some of our potential policy failures. Areas where we could go back in and actually reopen up to mixed use, multiple use areas with the goal of diluting the impact and creating more opportunities for quiet use by the fact that you don't have all the motorized guys stuck in three valleys. You, you spread them out into 12 valleys and your chances of coming across a group of snowmobiles are far less. Um, so that's a theory I want everybody to consider is dilution is the solution to pollution. So if the noise <laughs> and all that is the pollution, Let's expand the pile. Let's not continue to pick lanes and, and create smaller and smaller valleys. Are you making bumper stickers? I got lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to sit twister first. <laughs> uh, twister. Um, and two, two other real quick notes on the um, I wanted to bring up something that I saw that came out of the California thing. Is contact does not mean conflict. So the fact that multiple users see each other, that I'm up on skis and someone goes through the valley on a snowmobile, or a C5A galaxy flies by that's sitting here in Gunnison six times over the area I'm in, doesn't mean my experience is completely collapsed and I need to evacuate the area and go home. I can roll with it. 
I, I got to have some flexibility in the expectations that I have as a quiet user and some expectations that I have as a motorized user. <coughs> as a motorized, I don't want to come up on a group of cross-country skiers and think, I'm the woman. I want to know that there's some flexibility in that uh, inter interchange. So consider that contact does not mean conflict. Okay. Last thing, GPLI. Um, they had some prescriptions that we had to go in and try and wrestle around and remove some, some potential closures. They were very receptive, very helpful of us getting involved. However, it's largely occurring in a vacuum. It's a small group of users that do represent a diverse area. However, I can't find meeting minutes. I can't find postings of meetings. Getting public comment is challenging there. If that's one of the basis that we want to use for those things, we've got to open that process up and not just expose it once or twice a year, but expose it on a monthly basis so more voices can be at the table and come up with better products. That's all I got. Thank you. A lot of cool ideas. Thanks, Corey. Yep. There was a chair right here. Mm -hmm. You could have sat right here. Very good input. Uh, I'm James Up, and I'm also an outfit guide uh, permittee here. Have been for 33 years. Uh, guide snowball tours up on Kettler. And I was also part of the Game 9 back in 1995. Uh, and um, we started out with some meetings just like this. And the first two or three, were horrific. We all dug in. We don't want this closed. We don't want this closed. We, we want this. We want this. I think it's about the third meeting, and I think it was maybe Jim Starr said, "Hey, what if we go under the assumption that we're not going to close anything? You guys are going to have to all play together. What would you do?" And from then on, we started making some progress in those meetings. Eventually, we did have some areas that got closed, but I think that's. <coughs> It's very important that we maybe approach it that way again, because this is basically a repeat of Gang of Nine, just on a bigger scale. I was focused on Washington Gulch. We eventually compromised. We eventually did have some closure there. I eventually moved my permit area over to Kettler. Um, it wasn't required by the Gang of Nine, but it was just something that kind of happened down the road with uh, uh, mainly with snow, snow cat grooming and stuff that, that was set up by the Gang of Nine decision. So I think. That's something to consider. It might help moving talks along rather than everyone digging in because we got we've talked a lot about we have to, to listen to each other and play together. But that was a turning point for us. Is once we thought that was a possibility that nothing was going to get closed, we had to do something. We had to work together. And so I just want to throw that out there as something to maybe use in the future when we go through this process. Um, the other thing is, just real quickly, it sounds to me like if we just had a quiet snowmobile, we'd all be happy. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we're working towards that. You know, the manufacturer working towards these electric snowmobiles. Uh, of course, it may be another 20 years before the battery, battery life gets us to that point. But um, just to pose a question to Bill, for example, if we were, how, how quiet do we need to be? Uh, in, my, in my case, we, we run really quiet snowmobiles. Four strokes snow bills made by Skidoo, they're the best, they're the quietest snow bills out there. I can start them up out here, they're no louder than your car. Uh, on a daily basis, if there's someone skiing on the road, we sneak up on them with our tour. They don't care about it. They're also very clean. We can run them in this room for 20 minutes and never have to open the window. So the technology is getting better and better and better, and maybe that's the solution. We, 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 we limit what kind of technology we use on these trails, such as they do in, in Yellowstone. Uh, best available technology. So I guess my question to you, which kind of goes to what Corey was saying about the sound level, uh, you know, if the snowmobiles are quiet enough, are there still issues with motorized versus non-motorized? No, or because your whole issue is the sound and the, the aura, or is there something more there? Because it seems to me if the snowmobiles are quiet enough and the users are, are respective, then there really isn't that much conflict. Well, I think one answer to your question is if we just give it a few more years, the way my hearing's going, it won't be <laughs> I'm writing that down. <laughs> you know, are you asking me personally, or are you asking well, me? Well, it goes back to is there, is there an acceptable sound level? Because Maybe the expectation that you're never going to hear a sound at all is maybe a 
the threshold that, that we can, we're never going to be able to meet? Yeah, yeah. I don't think I can answer that question sitting here. You know, me personally, I think first we need an electric uh, snowmobile. And the next thing we need is a time machine, because I like to go back to about 1750. <laughs> yeah. Then I know it would be really quiet and, and really pristine. But that's just me. So I'd like to go I back in that. time with the electric <laughs> yeah, <there you> go. <laughs> So maybe that's something you could ask me to group. I think it's something we need to explore. Uh, right, something you can ask groups and, you know, because all we hear is, it seems to me like it's, we can't have a good experience, plus we hear zero sounds the entire time we're skiing. Well, yeah, I think that's, that's just, think perhaps that's, a, that's, you know, that's not going to happen. Yeah. It's just, that's, that's, so, I mean, anyway, that's why I ask Good. Yeah, I'm worrying to follow the sound tracks as well. And just to answer your question about the sound and snowmobiles, I know a lot of our members are concerned also about safety, especially in these near borders like, uh, like Slate River. For instance, there are a couple blind curves there. I know that I've been skiing there for over 20 years, and I know I've almost been taken out a couple of times. So that's just one thing that I think that we need to address as well. Yeah, so it's like etiquette and sound seem like the two big categories there. I, on that same note, I'm with the Crest Butte Mountain Bike Association, and um, I went to a summit this earlier this fall about mountain bike trails, and we talked about carrying capacity of trails, and especially if they're multi-use trails, multi-directional trails, how do you create balance between user groups? And one of the biggest takeaways for me was that when you improve people's behavior, you improve the carrying capacity of the trails. And so this goes back to comments that you guys said earlier about social education, and I know you, um, Bill and Brittany, at least you two are working on some etiquette posters and things, but I mean, maybe one part of this process going forward isn't just designations and research, but it's also outreach and stewardship and education of all of our users, so that, or signage at some of those blind curves or something, so that we can start to increase, improve behavior, improve camaraderie, community. I mean, this is a huge first step, but like we've been saying, we're just a small portion of it. So it's something as a mountain bike club we've thought a lot about in the summer for next year and going forward is like as we get more and more users, how can we create a better equilibrium among users? And I think that behavior piece, that etiquette piece is a huge piece of it. Um, you, you deal with a lot of conflicts by being a nice person and considerate of other users and empathy. So a way that we can take these lessons that we've learned in these seminars and start to distribute them outwards to other people, whether they're visitors to the valley or residents because we have to be able to reach both kinds of users. It's almost like we need a, another, something that's been as effective as like the Tread Lightly message um, and how much that changed the, the OHB side of things. Good ideas, guys. Yeah. I was just gonna mention uh, kind of wildlife conflict side of things and touching a little bit on what Kevin was speaking of. But not only we're considering the sounds of somebody wanting to silently <coughs> recreate, who knows if there's somebody's loud out there on their skis, we don't know that, but there are scientists out of CSU that are doing studies on uh, impacts to wildlife from uh, uh, motorized and even cars driving by. So there are science things being done to see what the impacts are of that. And I think there's a lot of folks on the table or at the table with non-motorized and motorized side, and then Kevin's for the, the animals, and so we can't forget the, the folks that can't speak for themselves, like Kevin was saying, I'm a big advocate myself for wildlife, so uh, not forgetting about that, regardless if CPW can have the uh, boots on the ground and be a part of the management plan side of things. And I think <clears throat> what that plays into is the same thing, is uh, are all of the, the users understanding the agency's concerns and then being able to work within those instead of just saying, well, this is what we found, this is the end we're closing it. Cool, hold on, there could be a plan B. There could be other ways around those scenarios that, um, that could be beneficial. Uh, for Bill and Brittany and Chris, my question is, uh, it's great to hear everybody talk about collaboration, 
I think that's the way that we're going to end up with a much more agreeable and effective <coughs> planning process. But those sorts of processes are not quick. And it's a challenge sometimes to get people to participate over a long period of time, to listen to the information that's necessary to understand everybody's perspectives on these issues and to sit down and try and hammer out some um, solutions to issues that we identify. Um, but a perennial problem that we have is getting folks to commit to that level of, of participation to get a good plan out. What ideas do you have from your groups or other perspectives on how we can achieve that type of participation to get a better planning process? I will say one thing. I 100% agree with that. Um, it's almost like it's this secret society club to, <laughs> to find out to know about anything. I mean, I wouldn't. I didn't know anything about this except I got contacted, um, and I got contacted because uh, maybe I'm a, a per, an influential person in my in my realm, which is great. But there's a lot of other people that. I mean, we just don't know about what is going on, or it's, it's not easily accessible. And when it's not easily accessible, we're going to take the path of least resistance, and it's, we're just going to keep going on until, again, I keep beating a dead horse there, but until it's already done and it's over, and okay. We're, and so for me personally, I think that is a, a tremendous point, and we will get better data with, with more people, I, I believe. Well, I think my answer is that we have a lot of people here tonight. We've had a lot of people here four nights, you know, four various nights for these winter lecture series. And I think there is interest, um, and I think that there already is commitment. I think we live in a very special place where people are, public lands are passionate. You know, people are passionate about their public lands. Um, and I would hope that people would just be willing to commit to developing a plan that's going to impact them and future generations um, down the line. Uh, I find that a little bit inspiring, personally, that you know we can we can have this impact right now um, or coming you know, coming up soon. Um, so I think the commitment is there. I also think our organizations. I mean, a number of our organizations are doing, you know, trying to do our work in communicating what is happening um, via social media, media, email, blasts, and things like that to the general public and hopefully keeping everything informed. Because I do feel like sometimes it is what Chris was saying, um, you know, sometimes you just hear about things through the grapevine, but the more connected you can be um, among organizations, you know, in the valley and even outside of the valley helps you um, disseminate some of that information so that people are educated and then hopefully more willing to come to the table. So. Well, I would add, uh, from my background as an engineer and a project manager, that I think the whole effort should start with some serious structured planning. And I think we should have a very structured plan as the steps that we hope to accomplish. And I believe that that should all be very transparent. And I think we should keep the public informed as we work our way through each step and we report out on what's happened along the way each way. I think that'll maintain interest, and I think it'll give people the opportunity to look forward to tackling the next step in the journey, because it's probably going to be a long journey. It's probably going to take a long time. And when progress becomes ambiguous, I think people lose interest. But if you can turn it into a disciplined approach and make a story out of it where people can see where they are in the process and where it's going to end up if everything goes right, then I think they will be interested. And it's complex, right? So, I mean, that's that's the trick. And it's kind of like marriage. You, you kind of have to work <laughs> through the hard stuff. And, you know, if you do it long enough, hopefully you look back and it was awesome. <laughs> I've got another question for Kevin. Um, an awful lot of uh, wildlife management during the winter is based on the resources that you have in terms of critical winter range maps. Those maps were generated quite a while ago, and I don't know how often you update them. But given the change of climate in the valley, 
how comfortable are you that your critical winter range maps accurately depict what critical winter range is, and if they don't, do you have any plans to update those as climate changes? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, those, those maps are essentially an amalgamation of expert opinion and some limited data collected over the past 30 years. And uh, when I say data, uh, maybe not collected in the methods that we have now available. So, starting about four or five years ago, um, we started collecting more data, better data. And uh, to really get a handle on what the animals are doing, you, you kind of need to watch it for about a 10 year cycle around here. You get those hard winters every, about every 10 years. And then you throw in a few drought years, last year, for instance. And uh, we learned uh, uh, you know, about some of the, I guess, some new tricks that the animals have with their sleeves. Um, Elk, um, for instance, north of CD Mountain Resort, almost up, you know, well into January. Um, and that is, uh, it, it's, it's really tough to put animals in a box. They, they don't know those boundaries always. They don't care about our political boundaries. They don't exactly care about, you know, trying to, let's say you do a wildlife closure around a specific area. And we argue about those boundaries all the time. Uh, but when push comes to shove, uh, the critters really don't care. And so I'm working on some other ways to represent um, animal utilization in the landscape. Uh, there's, well, for instance, uh, you guys heard from the link study, uh, some similar techniques, uh, but we're kind of in a lot of animals who are doing this, not just five or six, 20 links. Um, we've got uh, several hundred animals monitored right now with GPS collar units um, collecting similar kind of data. So, uh, a lot of those uh, analysis are pending. It's a lot of data to dredge through and, and, and get through. Uh, but I uh, uh, hope in the uh, coming years, um, especially after we finish a full 10 year cycle, perhaps we'll have some really good data. Uh, and start to develop models that can help us predict where animals are going to be in the future, even, uh, especially considering uh, warming climate, uh, less snow. Um, you know, I, I like to, uh, uh, you know, just let people know that uh, there's there's a great scenery out there. We all go out there and we enjoy the scenery. Um, but if you were to zoom in on any location on the landscape, look really close, uh, there's these little ants moving around. So actually, you know, deer, elk, moose, bighorn sheep, uh, lynx, pine marten, uh, coyote, bobcat, red fox, you name it. Um, they're out there. They're, they're just not as big and grand and easy to see as those big mountain viewscapes. Uh, and and I, uh, to me, they're a little more interesting than rocks and trees and snow. Um, they are very complex um, once you start to learn more about them. So, um, you know, along with um, you know coming up with better maps of where the wildlife are, uh, we're finding some pretty interesting stories behind those movements and utilization. It's not just the animals are here, but why are they there? And that's really the key. Is, um, why uh, why are all the deer crowded along Highway 50? Uh, besides the fact that the snow is too deep uh, in a hard winter, just a mile north. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're working on it. It's uh, not something that uh, is cheap. Uh, uh, I'm bringing in a lot of funding from outside the basin um, to do these kind of projects. Uh, people are interested in the Denison Basin and their, and their unique wildlife. Uh, so, um, Hope to continue those and expand upon them, and uh, uh, you know, hopefully get some products out here in the next five years or so. Thank you. Anybody else questions? Uh, my name is Todd. I'm one of the graduate students that's been helping out, um, and I've been lucky enough to come to all of the sessions so far. Um, and it does seem like a 
one of the big conflicts is uh, the soundscape. Um, but potential research that nobody's mentioned is a soundscape study that I think would uh, might might inform the situation. So I don't know if you uh, could comment on whether you think that would be a valuable um, piece of information to have um, when moving forward in the planning. Anybody? Yeah, um, I've been following some of the soundscape research, and that is something that's kind of came uh, came about really in the last five, ten years, and we're now able to put sound monitors on wild animals, at least the larger ones. Uh, some interesting studies coming out of the uh, Teton National Park, Yellowstone, and uh, even northwest Colorado on a mix of private and public land. Um, we're learning that uh, there, it's not just the disturbance of, you know, driving by these animals um, or traveling off trail, uh, they, they pick up on cues through the sound. Um, there's, we've kind of known this for a while with some of these critters, but um, there are, you know, there's a lot more research going on. Um, I just came across a study the other day, a uh, particular type of, uh, of rodent that is of conservation concern. Um, it actually uh, as ex can experience inner ear bleeding from uh, high decibels. So, uh, yeah, yeah there's, there's legitimate concerns there. Um, I, I'd like to hear, that's, that's great to hear that there's these technological improvements coming out to help quiet, um, uh, qu quiet the motorized uses a bit. I think that's, that's going to be a, a, a win, not just for the sound uh, tracks folks, but uh, uh, it will definitely improve on the disturbance related to wildlife. Um, but yeah, there's uh, you know, specific studies here. There, I mean, there, there's not a lot of those studies out there, but uh, it's something that we can drop on. Um, some of the first studies as far as impacts of snowmobiles on wildlife were actually done in uh, northwest Colorado. Um, they were not done with GPS collars. They were done a little more crudely. Um, but um, there, there were some significant results from those that uh, we still draw upon today. What's the rodent, and where is it in the winter? I, uh, it, it's a, it's a, somewhat less common type of kangaroo rat, and I believe it's, it's not a winter, technically a winter issue. But okay. I take they were saying that maybe somewhere in the southwest U.S. Uh, desert uh, type system with uh, intense motorized usage. Mm -hmm. I, can't recall exactly which year. Yeah, I'm curious. Um, just a thought that came to my mind is, uh, like, do you know off the top of your head how many species you're you're tracking or oh uh, tracking or understanding? Um, well, it's it varies on levels of intensity from uh, deer and elk and bighorn sheep. We are tracking them very intensively. They're um, important either economically or in the case of bighorn sheep, there's a um, a growing conservation concern, but uh, some of the other species we, we do have to rely upon studies from other areas and extrapolate that here, uh, which is uh, generally okay. Um, if someone finds uh, impacts on mountain lions or black bear in one area, they're, they're generally fairly uh, 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 translatable to other areas, at least you try to find those ecological equivalents, but um, yeah, there's there's a whole host of species out there, and uh, some of the uh, smaller ones uh, often uh, don't get a lot of, uh, I guess, attention, but uh, that's just the kind of way it's been. Um, and uh, I'm sure, though, uh, when when Forest Service goes through their planning process, you know, they're, they're going to be considering these. Um, especially with our input, we'll be you know, highlighting the ones of concern as they come up, uh, on you know, certain areas and so forth. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I know from my own experiences, you know, I've traveled quite a bit all over North America and in the winter in high elevations, and you know, I could probably count on one hand how many animals I've actually encountered out there. So. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a lot more you're not seeing. I'm sh oh, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> you ask yourself how many tracks you saw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I mean, there's. Well, it just shows like what do you you know what you're aware of 
there's animals that are using the submovium that they are kind of close to the ground, but still just right at the ground level below the snow. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's uh, uh, a whole, uh, there's quite an array of species, um, and depending on where you are. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about winter management down in the lower parts of the basin, it's, it could be a slightly different community of critters. I feel like I've seen little like snow weasels more than anything like in the mountains, but anyway, sorry. Uh, anybody else have any questions, thoughts? I'll take another. <laughs> um, uh, we mentioned a little about new technologies. Fat bikes are relatively new on the scene. Hybrid use is growing, uh, hasn't been around for a long time. Um, snow bikes are starting to come out. We're putting tracks on ATVs and side-by-sides. Uh, you talked about the potential technological advances of quieter snowmobiles. Are there other technologies that members of the panel see as a possibility within the time frame of this plan so that we can be sure to be taking those into consideration as we plan not just for what happened yesterday, but what could be happening 10 or 20 years from now? Well, one of my concerns from a noise pollution point of view is the advent of drones. And uh, I don't know if they're going to be an issue in the future as we try to recreate in our public lands, but uh, from time to time they're an issue in my backyard as I try to enjoy a quiet evening watching the sunset. So I suspect the day might come when they're also an issue in our public lands. Whether we can deal with that as part of winter travel management, I have no idea. If maybe it's not germane, but it's still another uh, stimulus to the environment. I think it's interesting to consider, you know, I, I worked in the snowmobile industry for many years and I watched the technology develop so rapidly that the way that, that the, all the technology is today is completely different than, well not completely, but it's been so much more refined and I think we're all you know, motorized and non-motorized alike. I think we're all like waiting for the electric snowmobile. Um, I, I know I'm excited for it personally, uh, but we're nowhere near it. But I mean, we went from horse and buggy to iPhone in a hundred years, for goodness sakes. Like, you know, and one thing I personally worry about is if we make decisions today that affect the next 30 years, and then in five years we come out with technology that that basically takes the sound away, or, you know, and we can work on some of these social etiquette aspects. Um, could we actually solve a lot of these problems? It would just be, in my mind, personally, a tragedy if we closed ourselves out of the land uh, based on you know, technology of five years ago. Yeah. John, I, I hear rifles going off behind my house and hunting season all the time. I'm not asking all those guys to carry silencers around. <laughs> I mean, I hear a guy miss an animal about six, eight times in a row and eventually get it. But it's, I mean, that's not a topic of discussion anywhere. Right? That's an interesting thought. And I can, I can just speak to your uh, comment about the, about the uh, noise from the drones. And I think it's safe to say we all hate the sound from the, the sound of the drones. It's an annoying sound. Um, <laughs> I'm, a, uh, I'm an airplane pilot, I'm also a drone pilot, and um, that's all going to be governed by, it is governed by the FAA, so it's going to not really be a part of the discussion, I believe. We can pitch and moan about it, but um, that's a much larger issue. Um, the airspace is what it is, and uh, they're grappling with that right now, for safety reasons, obviously. Uh, so more and more regulations are coming out. Uh, a lot of the obvious rules for, for, for drones are going to go away here within the next year. So it's going to be mainly licensed pilots flying those. Um, and if they fly those where they're not allowed to fly, they're going to lose their license. And in my case, I've not only lose my license flying the drone, I lose my license flying the airplane. Oh, wow. So um, some of that's going to solve itself. Um, some of it's out of our control, basically. Uh, but it is an issue. I'll, I'll, I, I do both those things as well. I understand you're concerned about the noise. So we're going to need a pilot on this panel, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, awesome. I, uh, I think we're about 
are we about hitting time? Or? We are. We're, we're about at time. Um, and I just want to thank so much our moderator and our whole panel.